Hello. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Welcome Hello. to the Hiring Lens Live. Um, I don't believe we were live last month because Thomas and I were both in Mexico in the yep. same city. And guess what? We were not able to meet up because of, oh. we'll just leave it here at the door, but that was very sad, <laughs> yeah. was very sad about that because I was very much looking forward to it, but we had a million curveballs thrown at us. So. Uh, it, one thing I would say though, it had nothing to do with me and you and our eagerness to see each other. That was one thing. It, that, like is, that is hundred percent correct. I was willing to spend, you know, some big bucks to get you over to have a coffee with me, but then we had another curveball thrown at us. So yeah, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that. And uh, we're very sad. Christine Trippy cannot be with us today. She had an urgent meeting she had to be with. I got a message from her last night, but of course, she's going to be very, very missed. Um, she's like a shot of coffee to the show. So <laughs> Christine, you're missed, but we'll see you next month. Uh, really excited to have Peter Ritchie on uh, today. Uh, Peter is with FAU. And if you're on LinkedIn uh, and you're watching with us, with us on LinkedIn and you're in the hospitality industry, it's pretty much guaranteed you know who Peter is. Uh, he's a very uh, opinionated person. And Peter and I have had many conversations about the current job market uh, for a while now. Uh, very unfiltered. That's why I wanted to call the show Truth Bombs, because I wanted Peter to be able to unfiltered, share his opinion, share his ideas, and have solutions. Because we can all complain about what's going on, but solutions are the most important thing to have a solution to the problem. And Peter has a lot of them. Uh, I really value his insight and I'm very excited to have Peter come on board. So um, you guys pretty much know who we are. I'll do my quick intro. And we'll go around the clock and then I'll bring Peter on. I'm Jeremy Nichols. I'm a Gecko Hospitality. I'm a hospitality headhunter in the state of Florida. And I'll pass it to you, Thomas, over here. Uh, I'm the managing director of Edwards and Finn. Here we go. Branding guys. You can't order these yet. But Can I have one? I, I do want one. <laughs> I may send you one because um, I've got enough of your gecko t-shirts now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, um, my name is Thomas Finn. I'm managing director of Edwards & Finn. We're a specialist revenue management, sales and marketing recruitment firm uh, based in the UK, but we operate uh, not only in the UK, but wider Europe and further internationally. Um, so yeah, that's that's me, guys. Amazing. I feel left out. So I want a gecko t-shirt. I want an <laughs> ENF cap and I'll, uh, I'll send you both a, a hoodie. Each. So, uh, oh, I do like those hoodies do. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, get it boxed up guys. Um, hi everyone. My name is Aiden. I'm the managing director of Ayla recruitment. Uh, we are a specialist finance and accountancy recruiter here in the UK, uh, covering the home counties and London. So, um, happy to be here again. Always a pleasure. And uh, looking forward to meeting Peter. And if you're tuning in live, feel free to tell us what you're watching from. Um, you can comment anytime. If you have some comments or you want to contribute to the conversation, I will put it on the screen. As long as it's there's no cuss words and it's appropriate, it's going to go up, I promise. So uh, feel free to, to chime in in the comment section. We're on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn Live right now. And just, yeah, just share with us any questions or ideas. But without further ado... I'm going to bring on Peter Ritchie. There he is. Hey. How are Hello, you? Peter. Wait, Christine's not here to see you. No. <laughs> see you. Oh, you're out of here. Get out of here, Peter. <laughs> How are you guys? We're good. Really yeah. good. Really good. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Even, you know, even Jeremy calling me opinionated. Well, let, let's hope they're good, reasonable opinions. I, I have to agree with that. But, uh, I'm trying to always base these opinions the past year on on facts and just the uh, the explosive connections we've made from FAU, which is Florida Atlantic University during COVID. Um, you know, I'm a lifetime guy in this business uh, and I love it and I eat it, drink it, breathe it every day. It's it's just my passion. So it'll never go away. I started as 14 and I've never left. I mean, uh, most of my time, food and beverage, hotels, a little bit of event planning for a year, a year at an airline, and most of my time in hotels. But I started teaching on the side when I was in my young 20s, and then teaching became my full-time gig about 15 years ago. So there's not a week that goes by that I'm not out in a hotel or a restaurant or with an event company doing a project. So I, I always like to call myself an a hospitality guy, not really an educator, but the education is my day job. 
you know, um, I was I didn't do a proper intro for you because your title is so long, and I didn't oh, want to mess it up. I didn't want to mess it up. So I wanted you to introduce your title because that, yeah, it's, basically it's, I'm <laughs> I'm the director of the hotel program at FAU. Like, and every program you go to around the world will have a managing director, a dean, and um, an executive director. But it's all the same position. So we're kind of the I always call it the general manager of the hospitality and tourism academic program. So we oversee the faculty, the curriculum, the budgets, the, the positioning, and so on. And, and at FAU, our positioning is within a business school. We are um, probably the ninth or tenth largest business school in the U.S. We have about 8,300 students at any one time. And across the United States, there's probably a thousand bachelor's degree granting programs in hospitality. And there's only about 40 of them that are housed in business schools. That's on the move up. So we might be about 50. But the business school model is uh, very similar to what Aiden recruits for. We have majors in accounting, finance, marketing, economics, and hospitality is one of the majors. But in a business school model, um, it really ties into what Thomas recruits for too, because there's a focus on quantitative, predictive yeah. analytics, data mining, uh, profit and loss. It's different from the traditional etiquette service-based hospitality schools. And it's more of a newer way of education. So that's kind of what my day job is, is uh, with FAU. Uh, I was extremely happy. We grew to one of the largest programs in the U.S. in a decade, and then COVID came. Um, we're, we're about 1,300 students. We're about 750 now, and we're on the way back like the rest wow. of the world. But um, but that's kind of that's kind of my thing. So, kind of your thing. That is your thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, 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 that is you. That is you. Mr. The hospitality, then, Peter. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I you know that I attributed my whole career to the mentor I had as a teenager who was in fine dining and owned restaurants, and it just instilled in me a feeling of. I just the kind of guy holds the door, says hello, you know, even yeah. the cranky neighbors try to make them smile, you know, whatever. That's just my style. So hospitality is who I am. And I never realized it till I got older, but I've always had an HR bent. I mean, um, every when I was a regional and had 15 hotels, if I was on a call, it was almost always culture building, recruiting, retention. Um, I taught on the side, like I said, for 10 or 12 years before I ever became a full-time academic. So I was always actively recruiting and pumping up young people to get into this business. So that's kind of my background. Well, um, the reason that obviously the, the name of the episode was Truth Bombs, and I kind of alluded to why in the intro. Um, I really want to dig into it and get your uh, opinion. Because <laughs> I I respect it and you have a good a lot of good ideas, but most importantly, you know, when when, when we we speak a lot on 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 the show, Aiden Thomas and I we 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 interview for a living, so we get a very transparent opinion from candidates on what is really happening, and, and many people know that I, I come from corporate. I spent the majority of my career there first, and when I went over to uh, headhunting and third party recruiting, I quickly realized. There is a difference on the um, what you hear from candidates. Uh, they feel a little bit more comfortable sharing what they want because they know that you're working for many different employers, not just one. Because when I was corporate, they wanted their answer, their questions to fit that particular culture that I was inter interviewing for. But when they know that I have several different companies I work for, they're kind of loose and they'll tell me what they really want because they want to fit something specific. My point is, you know, as recruiters, we do hear a lot from the candidates, but I think you as, um, you know, a professor and someone who's dealing with students and alumni, I, I, I know you're hearing probably even more transparent conversations because with us, they're interviewing with us. So there's still a tiny bit of a guard. They right. still will share with us what's going on, but with you, they're not even interviewing with you. Right. right. And you know what happened also is, you know, I did my doctorate at UCF, University of Central Florida, which has a tremendously large program here in Orlando, uh, 3000 students. So I have alumni over the past, I don't know, I've probably been teaching since I was 23. 
So I have alumni now for like 20 plus years and nobody filters with me. And then I have employees. I probably have 15,000 former employees. They don't filter either. Then came COVID and uh, we had, you know, our big certificate that we did through FAU. So now I have 90,000 new friends and that's growing every every year to over 100,000. So uh, for some reason, if it's my personality or whatever, everybody opens up to me and tells me the real deal. So what I do is I just compile and compile and, and try to look at trends. What I really like is that the conversation is changing. Um, it went from pre-COVID, this is the best industry to work, we have a blast, we love it, etc. But the negatives were always long hours, low pay, and I don't know, um, I'd rather be a doctor or a lawyer because my parents are telling me that, or an accountant. Mm -hmm. You know, because always being an accountant, there's always a job. That was always the thing I heard in the States, you know. Then, you know, in the midst of the crisis, the big word was betrayal. You betrayed me. For many years, you you instilled in me the ability to take care of guests, to always do the right thing for passengers, to to take care of my theme park attendees and all that. And now you pulled the rug out. So I'm mad at you and I don't like it and I don't ever want to work in it again. And that was the social media frenzy, the conversation of the day. And uh, I call it the loss of love, loss of labor. That's, that's just what I termed it. And we did a big study. It was proven out. It shook out. Jeremy and I knew it way before it was coming. Nobody believed us. Oh, no, it's government handouts. They'll be yeah. back, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, right, right. You know? So that, that. that conversation happened. And then a lot of my long-term friends – um, said at some point along the way, you know, we've got to get sexy back. You know, that's uh, so I'm like, all right. So I, I would play Justin, Justin in the background and I'm like, okay, we got to get sexy back. So we got to move the conversation, you know? And, and I agree. So I started asking, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? Well, the U S is very different from other places. I, um, I was just talking to this, this, uh, gentleman, Cletus, Rahimi, who you have to look up, he started a movement in Italy called the GTO Conference. It basically stands in Italian for young tourism professionals. And he created a movement during COVID and now has government support, is working with the Saudi government. The conversation there is now different from what it is here. So in the US, the reaction was, I need to get my business back open. I can't find anyone, let's pay better. And then everybody started to fight with each other over dollars. Well, that worked to get the heads back into the building to an extent. And most places I go now are about 80 to 100% staffed. So it worked, but they're staffed with a newer type of person who didn't come from hospitality before. And now the conversation is I can't keep them. I can't retain them. They're leaving in three to six months because they didn't realize how volatile, crazy our business is. And the first time they have an irritated guest or they have to pick up two extra shifts, they're out. So, so now it's gone from, I don't want to work there anymore. I've told my kids, neighbors, friends, dogs, cats to stay away from hospitality to we're going to pay well and I'm going to get you back. And here, here's just an anecdotal before you go on your question. We were stuck in South Florida in the 10 to $13 an hour range for new front desk agents at hotels, the entry level job. Now they're 14 to $23. And so salaries went up 30% overnight. The business owners and operators don't really know how to absorb that yet, but they had to do it to get heads back in the building. You know, and so now the conversation is retention and where do we, we go from here? So just very interesting travel of a road. I don't know how to call it, you know. <laughs> retention is everything now, right? Like you get people back in and, yeah. and, and now the problem is, right, how do we hold them? How do we entice them to stay yeah. and, and not lose them to competitors and other jobs? And 
That's what Abs- we're, we're seeing. Absolutely. And we so laid off, sa- you know, we laid off sales, marketing, and HR the heaviest during COVID and the fastest. So we don't necessarily have the fully staffed, strongest HR departments back in place. And this is the first time I've I've seen the conversation so heavy on retention and engagement and training again. How long have we been talking about that on here, guys? 40 years. Oh, yes. Aiden. <laughs> I, oh I was going to say, on here from day one. I've seen, Every yeah. time. That's why Christine's on the show. That's why she's so valuable, yeah. because even though it's the hiring lens and we're recruiters, us, you know, mm. Thomas, Aiden, and I, myself, we, we had to bring Christine yeah. on because she's on the training and onboarding side. So it brings it full circle. And it's we've been saying this, and it's it's not stopping, and which, which is one of our questions. I'm going to pop it up. And Thomas, I know that I think that you were just in a meeting as well. Do you want to kind of take the question and talk to Peter? It's the one right here. What is the most common complaint by current job seekers regarding their onboarding and training process? Was that the question? Uh, it was actually regarding the, the students oh. in terms of their. Okay. So, yeah, but, but I, I'm more than happy to obviously talk okay. on this point as well. Um, so in terms of obviously onboarding and, and training process, um, one of the biggest things uh, in terms of the onboarding process or, or at the initial stages of talking. So if we look specifically at graduates right now, because again, that's sort of where we're looking at, you know, universities going into their first jobs. Um, I was in, I was hosting a meeting yesterday where we had a number of, of uh, university, either senior lecturers or heads of department. Um, and one of the biggest things that they noticed at careers days in particular was all these hospitality brands, all these massive international corporate brands were there with their HR teams and usually uh, a member of uh, either the commercial team or operational team. Um, And what they were saying was a real general statement of, we would love for you to come uh, to our business. We would love for our new talent or the next generation of hotelier to come to us because we can provide an amazing environment, amazing career prospects, and we want you. That was the real message because these universities are the top tiers in the world. So we have Swiss universities, uh, but also UK uh, based universities as well. Um, and as soon as they started the process, so if you look at the life cycle of a, of a student leaving university, they start putting in their applications before they graduate. You know, if they're, if they're, if they're smart, they're you know, worth their salt, they start looking at applications before they graduate. Every single one bar none from all the universities that attended yesterday said that the biggest feedback from the students was every single response said they needed more experience. What is the point, and I'm gonna say this to every hotelier and every brand that watches this video now, because I said it yesterday to some of the largest brands in the world, what is the point in sending a HR representative and an operational or commercial leader to that site, say everything they were told to say, and then not deliver at the back end? What confidence does that give in the market as a whole, but also in that student? Because what, that, what will happen is as um, Peter's already indicated, these people talk. They talk to the lecturers, they talk to other people in the industry, they talk to everybody else in their class. Don't bother going there because they won't take you uh, because you don't have any experience. That message falls into nothingness as soon as that student gets that message. Oh, well, what's the point? I'll go to another industry. Then we're immediately losing fantastic talent that wanted to come to us because of a simple either automated or copy and pasted message. What is well, the point? The, yeah, that's fascinating. And you know something, um, it, we, we require in our program the equivalent of six months of full-time work experience before you graduate, a thousand hours. And we're not the highest in the, in the educational sector that does that. Mm-hmm. And um, because we're in South Florida, which is a tourism mecca, most of our students graduate with 2,000 hours, but it, it, but that is a common complaint that there's a disconnect between expectations from the industry versus what the colleges are putting out. And it, it's funny yep. you say this because last me, last week I was at a Florida Restaurant Lodging Association meeting, and I led a curriculum discussion for about 45 minutes. Um, we offer a Bachelor of Business Administration with a major in hospitality. Other schools offer a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of this. The employers have no idea what they're getting. 
they go mm -hmm. out and they recruit, but they haven't done the due diligence to see what is in the curriculum to better match the hires. So I'm, I've proposed in our small microcosm between Orlando and the Keys to mm -hmm. do round tables of focus groups so at least our recruiters know what they're getting. Um, but how, you know, I've had them tell students to, oh, you know, you really don't have that extra year we were looking for in food and beverage. Well, then why are you recruiting right out of college? So, you know, there, there's an also a bigger picture going on here. The, the enrollments globally are down in hospitality after COVID, yeah. globally, bar Still? none. Have, Still. Has there been an improvement? Um, you said 60%. When we there, spoke. there, uh, it, it it was a drastic hit for a semester or two. Right. I think yeah. now I would I would conservatively say we're down ten to twenty percent globally, without any factual study. That's my guess. I agree with you, that. The conversations you, yesterday. Yeah, if you think about that, we only produce a small fraction of the workforce that's needed. We're producing the future general managers, the future revenue optimizers, the future restaurant owners. We're not producing the hourly step. That's also down because of the negativity from, from COVID. So we've got a double prong workforce issue in, the, in motion. So, you know, to Thomas's point, I've already realized there's a disconnect with our recruiters and I'm working personally to explain this is what Jeremy Nichols comes out with. He has nine months at Chick-fil-A. He has four months in the Disney College program and he's had classes in accounting finance. This, these are the expectations you will get from a business school graduate studying hospitality and I'm trying to partner with my recruiters so they are pleased and not upset yep. and know what they're getting. But that disconnect is a um, is a long-term problem of hospitality education because in the 90s and early 2000s, the reality shows of celebrity chefs and Jennifer Lopez being a wedding planner in multiple <laughs> movies I'm serious. All of this pushed the fact that if you open your doors, you can teach hospitality and they will come. So we've been producing quality products that are not the quality that I would want as a recruiter. So it's also led to a disconnect in programs and what they produce. Now, your schools are the top. I mean, the Swiss schools, the European schools in general, the the British schools, I mean, they're the, they're the tops in what we teach. And if there's a disconnect there, think about what's going on in countries that are just starting to have tourism education. Yeah, I think um, I want to come on to, to Marcia's um, question, but just on the back of what you said, because I'm so happy you did. We actually, well, we put into place, because I'm a board member of, um, a, a, of one of the universities with regards to their reviewing their syllabus. So we, we do it every couple of years. Um, but that was the biggest disconnect. And that is exactly why I brought those universities there yesterday, because we could bridge that gap and show them exactly what the students are actually leaving with. And as you say, at least six to eight months with the students that I guess lecture anyway, six to eight months that they have to have practical on property experience. But on the back of that, if anybody's interested in revenue management and, of course, now sales and marketing going forward, we actually, so my business actually provides open days within a large corporate office, a single property and a smaller hospitality uh, or hotel management company. So they get to experience what it's like to actually work in revenue management in a large corporate office compared to what that looks like in a smaller luxury hotel and then also a hotel management company. We do that completely free of charge to everybody but it's just to ensure that our clients understand what exactly the caliber is coming out of the university. So I'm, I'm just so happy you said that because that is exactly the initiative that I think needs to happen more. And that bridging that gap will cause, well, sorry, will alleviate so many uh, stresses in that process. But um, sure. yeah, yeah, sorry, Aiden, I was going to say you've already responded to Marcia, so I, I won't step on your toes there. But yeah, if you want to bring that up. 
You know, Marcia's yeah. question Marcia's question is spot on. I mean, we often I I often make the mistake of saying, you know, new people to the industry, which implies young people, but we reach out to everyone and anyone. My certificate taker average age was about 45, but I had in the age range from 77, I think, or 78 down to 16. So I reach out to anybody. I, um, you know, in hotels and restaurants and event companies these days, you'll have from age 17 up to 70. So you have four different generations working together. I think in South Florida, um, our retirees are a wonderful uh, group to work with. They have the maturity. They're used to dealing with difficult guests. South Florida is known for difficult, demanding guests. Pretty much anywhere in the world is now, but um, we are trying. And it's interesting because in my certificates and degrees, my age has slowly risen over the 15 years I've been here at FAU. My average age continues to climb. Um, and what's nice is that people who were displaced in the workforce during COVID, many of them never worked in hospitality, but they have the skills from financial services, you know, um, we have people who are relationship managers with Bank of America. We have Walgreens and CVS pharmacy retail managers that want to shift into hospitality. Our big grocery chain here in Florida is Publix, and they're known for great service. So Publix has many employees who are now shifting and studying hospitality. So my net has gotten bigger in terms of who we look for. But there's so many little prongs we're talking about because one of the prongs is just the shorter supply in college grads, period. That's an impact. Another one is, you know, um, it, it's just where do we go? You know, should there be more streamline in what we teach or should there be multiple varieties in an education process to the recruiters, which is, I think, probably better? because you should be able to recruit the best event planners from here, the best HR generalists from here, and, and so on. We can't be all things to everybody, you know? Those roles, though, I mean, the, the question Marcia was the proposed, um, reaching out to the older demographic, I mean, let's be honest, you know, what roles are we talking about here? Because we have, you know, entry level, mid-tier, and then senior, senior leadership. And what's the elephant in the room? You know, you have right. a lot of senior, you know, uh, citizens that constantly will DM me that they're applying for senior leadership roles, uh, directors and up, and they're not getting responses. And that that's a well, truth. Just, I can tell you, I, I love animals. And I have thought about retiring from academia and going into an entry-level role to work in a veterinary office or a pet smart or something. I um, I have not had one response to probably 150 applications over the past three years because they see, and I don't even include my education on my resume, but they don't see anything pet related. So we're still very siloed in how we review resumes, and it's gotten very, it's gotten worse. I really can't, I want to jump in on that one. Really yeah. we're, we're all, I'm, we're all like little like. Honest, but I really want to jump in that. But what so, about the algorithms? You know, like I'm probably no, wait, getting screened out. No, it, it, honestly, a big a big swath of it is recruiters and gatekeeper HR that are lazy. That's the fact. They look at resumes so quick, and they literally have in their mind those mental check boxes that they think that candidate's not going to meet. Like for instance, you talk about age, let's talk about consulting or being an entrepreneur, right? So you have someone who comes from the industry that used to be a director or senior leadership. They went on their own, they consulted for five, 10 years. Then they want to come back and work in corporate. Ev almost every single, I say, I don't want to say every, because that's a broad stroke, but almost every single hiring manager on the corporate side will say, they don't, do they really want to come back and work for somebody? They've been working on their own. They don't know how it is. They're used to make up their own hours. They were their own boss. They don't want to come back. You know how many times I've disqualified people because of that? I'm not right. saying that that's not a factor because it is because I am a consultant. Do I want to go back to corporate? My wife, my wife, you're killing us. What? <laughs> what she said? <laughs> you're, not like you're, you're like, 
<laughs> you're lucky you're uh, you're always on the show and i and i love you <laughs> <laughs> marcia it's, it's the best, that's Mar the best i comment. gotta see marcia's comment now she said I most of the are 12, 12 going on <laughs> okay all right, all right all right all right there you go there you go all right that's the <laughs> comment. i didn't see him marcia but, I mean, but she's agreeing with what i'm saying most recruiters and i am a recruiter most of them are lazy you know they just yeah. they they're looking really quick uh, and they're checking those mental check boxes. And I'm not yeah. saying recruiters, I'm saying every, across the board, internal, external, it needs, and we, we need to be more open-minded and take the time to speak to somebody on the phone because there's always a story. I'm not saying yeah. call every single application, but if they're like 50% there and you have a little bit of a second guess on a candidate, and maybe you're wondering those red flag questions, call them, talk to them. Yep. I can tell you yep. right now in this market, we do. I do for sure, because we just don't have the luxury of having a lot of talent. We do. I'm not going to sit back and sit on my hands and just like look at a piece of paper and move it aside, but it is happening anyway. That's yeah. My and I think, I you know, like in my little anecdotal case, there's nothing on there that says veterinarian. There's nothing there that says animal care, animal this. So, but it's interesting that you wouldn't take someone who has a genuine love of people and animals and has worked in hospitality whole career and not even consider for a front desk job. But it's just the way the world works with, and we're all so busy and we rely more and more on automation and efficiencies. So it's not really that you're lazy, Jeremy, it's that you're efficient and you have a pile of work, which is happening in every business, you know? Yep. If it's commercial strategy. You're so nice. You're so nice, no, but <laughs> but, it, but it's true. If it's commercial strategy, you know, Thomas's clients want the best, fastest revenue optimizer they right. can find for the right pay and who's going to do the best i mean everybody's in in the crazy world that we live in but there's still know? candidates that can do that that do meet those requirements that sometimes yeah. like the, the the age issue or education or mm -hmm. you know entrepreneurship regardless like those are things that are not in the requirement right those are mm -hmm. things that that person that candidate could essentially do if they meet all the requirements from, from that you do on the intake call from the client like they literally can do everything so these right. are like these are some these are assumptions is what I'm trying to say. These are okay. assumptions. They're assuming that the person can't do it because of age or their 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 new entrepreneurial um activity or their education level, right? But if it's not a requirement, anyway, I'm going on a tangent, but that's I mean a lot of that does happen. Um, it, but there's there's plenty. I mean, obviously, all three of three or four of us in here are recruiters, so I'm not like saying not saying all recruiters are, but that's happening. Yeah. Right. Maybe you can say the, people, the other thing people. to add on that. Um, just a quick add. I feel I think we've had a show on this topic, Peter. Like I think we've spoken. Yeah. You can probably tell we're all, we're all getting a little bit uh, excited to like <laughs> our, own, our own point here. But um, you, know, a, a lot of recruiters, be it us and HR generally, talent acquisition teams, the the issue probably comes as well from not challenging line managers enough, from not challenging mm. what actually people want. So you make an assumption that for an entry level veterinary role, because the line manager or somebody has said, oh, that'll be a really good job for someone looking for their first role in, in veterinary practice. Mm -hmm. In your head, you go, right, okay, well, I need to find someone looking for their first job. Whereas what we should be doing is saying, oh, great, okay, fine. But what does the first role look like? Because yeah. are you saying a first role and therefore we're going down the sort of ages route, you know, you're only looking for, for somebody starting their career or their first role and it doesn't matter what they did previously. So it all comes down to how recruiters are challenging as well. Like it's our job to to find solutions, right? Not just try and find a perfect candidate. And and now more than ever, we're seeing a lot of people change industry, um, re-qualify, re-study, look for different roles, uh, come out or go back into hospitality. So I think actually now more than ever, recruiters and talent acquisition teams need to be challenging the norm and trying to find solutions as opposed to um, yeah, what they thought they always could, which was a perfect CV. Yep. Well, yep. very interesting. You know, that's going to get even more challenging because if you think about the variety in curriculum across the, the world, um, and you know, the curriculum is just so varied. Think about now the entire global movement in micro-credentialing. Um, the employers don't really know what they're getting out of a micro-credential either, yet they see the logo or the seal from the institution that they already have a mindset on of who they've recruited maybe MBAs from. 
So, mm -hmm. you, you know, so on the, on the recruiter side, it's a lot more work on your part to understand what goes into these. Is a credential of 30 content hours in accounting even remotely similar to the bachelor's or is it so far removed and so simplistic that it's not appropriate for your client? I mean, the, these are very important questions that take a lot of time to shake out. So, yeah. you know, when, when Jeremy said truth bombs, one of the truth bombs I hear from these applicants is they don't understand my certificate. You know, so I, I hear it over and over again. What, what did I learn? I'm like, well, you had 30 hours of basic content. You did not have a bachelor's degree. So are you selling it on your resume as if you have a bachelor's degree? So all of this from a recruiter, there's no algorithm or system or prediction that's going to filter through all this. It's going to take the human looking at the resume and having a conversation like, like Jeremy yeah. said, you know? Yeah, which, yeah, exactly. Which goes back to what we were saying, like taking the time. If, if you're 50% on a candidate, you know, just take the time to get their story. There's always a, everybody has a story. You know, there's yeah, been yeah. several candidates that I've placed where if you look on the resume or the CV, they might not look like they're, they might be like 10th out, out, out of the list that you have the call. And then, or, and they work out. Like I, I can tell you just recently, you know, I had a hire like that and that person just did not have the on paper wasn't nearly as strong as the five in front, but leapfrogged through the process yeah. and ended up getting the role. Yeah, I had the same thing like nine months ago and I, I went round and round and round thinking that I was going to find what I thought I needed and I held off on an application that I had from really early in the process and um, if, to be fair, I, I, I train our recruiters not to do that. If you have any doubt, you should pick up the phone and call, right? But for whatever reason, at that point, I didn't and then it must have been a couple of weeks that I then thought, okay, I need to have a conversation with them because... I'm going around and around. I'm a little bit unsure, but I need to pick up the phone and find out. And immediately spoke to them. They were brilliant, amazing. Didn't have the exact skill set we were looking for, but it was so transferable, came across so well. It ticked like four out of six boxes. And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I was kicking myself going, why don't I just pick up the phone? I always say, just if you have any doubt, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. And I didn't on this one occasion. Um, so don't get me wrong, like we can't phone every candidate all the time and every application, mm -hmm. but yeah, we do need to challenge the norm. And, and the, the truth bomb in that is look, we're not going to we're not going to phone every application and every candidate we get. So Correct. if Here's, you're sending 50 applications, try and follow up, you know, 20% of them. Just mm. make it your responsibility to follow up because the sooner you get on the, a phone call with a recruiter, you know, the, the better the outcome in reality. When in doubt, give them a shout. <laughs> I like it. Absolutely. Well, you know, you, you know something. You know something very interesting. There's a, a a city here, a small city called Pompano Beach. It's in Broward County, near Fort Lauderdale. And um, a lady who works at the city, her daughters took our COVID certificate, and they really became enamored with it and loved it. So this lady applied for a grant. And she won the grant, and we offered our certificate in person to residents of the city who wanted to learn something about hospitality. So now think about the mixture in our audience. They were from age 18 to 77. Some people had never worked in hospitality. One owned a hotel, this and that. So what I'm seeing as a trend, um, and it could be my lens of teaching it from the business school, but the hospitality transferable skills are everywhere now. Everybody wants them. And everybody realized during COVID, we can steal your workers because Boom. they are great. Right there. Yeah. There's a bomb. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if it's a communication that's accurate and prompt, if it's care, if it's an innate diet desire to help, if, mm -hmm. it's, um, if it's just the ability to empathize with the person in front of you, I don't care if you're an accountant, if you're an IT doing a project rollout. I was at the Hard Rock Casino this weekend. There was an IT guy that I could have hired for the front desk to be a concierge. He was just so skilled at fixing his IT side, but also interacting with me as a guest, as a casino player. 
And I said, you're destined for hospitality. And I found out he has a bachelor's in IT and a master's in communications and just fell in love with the business. So I think our education world will, it, again, through my lens of being in a business school, we are going to work with recruiters from far more industries than we used to because they want the skills that we've always had in hospitality. Now, again, that makes it challenging because we're producing fewer and fewer for the industry that needs them. Yeah. But I thought it was eye-opening during COVID, the things that we already knew that the world just didn't seem to know. I mean, why not hire a Disney cast member or a JetBlue person or, you know, an American Airlines former flight attendant? They're going to be great with dealing with customers in your retail store, in your freestanding bank, in your oil change automotive business, whatever it your is. Your recruitment your industry. Center. Yeah, 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 recruitment. Yeah. <laughs> recruitment benefited a lot. I mean, it's the skill set and the competencies. I mean, I look at excellent communication, prompt response, care for the client, uh, professionalism, and an understanding of the person in front of you. I mean, those mm -hmm. are skills that can go anywhere. And it was funny because all of a sudden, like a flashlight shine, like, hey, we could do whatever. You know, you can train me on the IT. You can train me on the spreadsheets if, if I have a finance leaning or orientation. But if I'm going to be the fastest person to respond when you call about your portfolio and I'm going to be there when your kids graduate and all and I have the hospitality skills, but I'm also a financial planner, I'm going to be the best one in the neighborhood. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just common sense. I um, want to bring up a couple questions that I have prepared for you. Um, yeah, I'll bring it right up right now. You've been mentioning this idea of a benefits bucket as a retention and attraction possibility. Uh, I just wanted you to take the time to explain it uh, so the audience understands what you're, you've been talking about. Yeah, see, like one of these things that kind of struck me is that, you know, and again, it's very U.S. based. But, you know, we have medical and dental as kind of like the standall free for all benefits in our jobs. Some places have short and long term disability retirement, life insurance, et cetera, but always medical dental. But when COVID hit, a lot of people were telling me, oh my goodness, I wish I would have had uh, pet insurance, or I really wish I would have had some money to do a certificate instead of a degree. The tuition reimbursement only goes for a degree. Or here in, in uh, our area, uh, housing allowance, How, housing prices have uh, risen astronomically in, in the past five years, more than ever before. So there was a, um, a hotel owner here who did a study of his room attendants. And the room attendants that had been with him 20 years or longer, yes, he has amazing tenure, they all owned homes, 100% of them. In the 10 to 20 year, most of them did not. And then in the under 10 years, they were all living with friends and colleagues and family because they couldn't even afford regular rent. So mm -hmm. the difference in how our money went in hospitality in the past 20 years really changed. So I went to a couple employers that asked me to do some consulting. And I said, how about this? You're spending X amount of dollars per employee per month, $2,000. Take that same money and let's put it in a bucket and go to them and ask them what are the things they would want. And we came out with the most creative things, grocery allowance, housing allowance, Uber gift cards, um, this and that. You know what was the, the number one least wanted? Medical insurance. <laughs> really? Because they, wow. either had, they, really? Either had it, yeah, they either had it through the spouse uh, okay. or they had um, Affordable Care Act here in the U.S., which made it, it, less expensive than what they needed for housing and transportation. So, of course, yes, it's an HR problem because you have to administer it. So three of the very successful venues that are doing it now, if they were spending 2000 per employee, they're now spending 1950 as an example. And that $50 helps offset the administrative cost. And you are allowed to pick the two things from the bucket that you like, and you can change once a year, just like you always did with open enrollment. 
Um, and a lot of them are gravitating toward housing allowance because it is so expensive. Now, housing allowance can count as taxable income. So there has to be a way to tax it up and to make it work. But I'll tell you, it's really made like um, they have a, a group in most in one of the hotels that is the benefit bucket, you know, yeah. kingdom. And uh, they have things like uh, pet insurance. Um, a car, one of them was like bi-weekly car washes. It uh, sounds like an a la carte, like an a la carte yes. benefits option, Ow. right? That's, pretty, that's pretty cool. Daycare. We've always heard daycare, daycare, yeah. daycare, yeah. daycare. Um, yeah. And and then one and then uh, PTO days. You can buy out extra PTO days now. Administration. I know my HR friends watching this are like, "Shut up! This is too hard. I can't mention." <laughs> but but it's a it's a way for engagement. If you're picking your benefits and you have a company that loves you and you're happy and you have seven cats and you want pet insurance as your benefit, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna hook you to stay in my culture. So yeah, because it's like an assumption that like the most important thing medical is, dental, right? Medical so, like, dental. Give people, that's like a really smart idea. Look at every job posting. You'll see our benefits. Totally. Medicals always first, you know. And yes, it's extremely important, but it may not be important to the people in your house because mm -hmm. they may have it. You know, um, your significant other may already have it, so it's duplicative. So it's not doing you any personal tie or benefit. So I love it. And I thought it was the easiest idea and just something I, I threw out there. Um, and I've had, I'd say it's an, an 80, 20 interest, 80% are interested. I would say implementation is still paltry at probably like three or 4% because of getting your arms around administering it. And I have many branded and or management company individual assets that want to do it that can't because they're tied into the management company and the brands. That's really so cool. they have to find a creative way to work around it. My independent um, restaurants and others are great. You know, the other one that ties into this, Jeremy, you probably heard of them a lot on the West coast of Florida is these new models of pay for restaurant workers where they're tied into profitability. Um, some people are trying to do that, but I find it very, in my conversations and focus groups, I find it um, not very interesting to the associates because they need their cash now. That's um, with bonus thing too. It ties yeah. into bonus. A lot of times they try to pitch bonus like, well, you want you want 70, but the position is 60. But with bonus, you're going to get to be 80. And almost every candidate on the phone will say, no, no, no. Bonus is bonus. Yeah. I want my it's base. It's there. Right? You know? So another they, another yeah. one of the, uh, the benefits buckets is daily pay. Um, and the companies are really struggling with that, but they want daily or weekly pay. They want it more frequent. And I have an even number of casinos and restaurants and hotels that want to do it. And I have others that say, if I pay you every day, you're probably likely to not show up tomorrow. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting conversation there. But well, I, what, have some, I have wouldn't some. Wouldn't that companies. have to do with the company? If they yeah, don't show up exactly. Tomorrow? <laughs> exactly. Well, that, we're. We're HR here, but uh, but the um, the gig workers they want faster, quicker pay. So waiting two weeks to get paid as a room attendant is sometimes quite difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's up to the employee to budget properly, but paying on a daily basis is another one that some have implemented, and there are some apps now for that, and um, it's interesting. But yeah, bonus means nothing to me. Tell me what my base salary is, what I'm going to take home every two weeks. The other stuff is if you love me and I produce for you and I make Aiden happy and he sends me a Christmas bonus, good for him. But I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't buy that anymore at this stage of you, my uh, career. You know, you that's made, the fluff. That's you made the that, Justin, I call it, yeah, you I call it fluff and, fluff and puff. You made I that Justin it. Timberlake reference that bringing sexy back. So I'll do the Megan Trainer. It's all about it's all about that base. Like uh, it's not it's not about that base. Not about, not yeah, but base. Think, think about that. Think about if you're a part time busser in a restaurant, 
how am I even going to wait or understand when you're going to do an end of month profit and loss and it's going to leave me an extra $18? I mean, I don't have the time for that. I don't care about it. Um, and it's not giving me buy-in. From a general manager, I'm getting buy-in if you're making me a managing partner. But I'm not getting that yeah. as an hourly. I'm just not. Um, I want to bring up something else that you uh, we should touch on that you mentioned is um, short-term turnover. All right. Can you please explain, uh, you know, what you mean by that and uh, let us know why you believe this is happening at, a, at such a grand scale? I'm hearing it everywhere constantly daily. So I know if I do another macro level research, it's just going to prove itself. It's kind of like the mass exodus with COVID. Um, what I think happened is we irritated so many people with betrayal during COVID. Again, I preface it saying I don't know what else we could have done, but the perception is reality. So similar to that group that disappeared is a new group of workers coming in for the pay. And it may be U.S. centric because I, I heard in Italy they haven't raised the pay. I've heard in Greece they haven't raised the pay. I don't know what's going on in, in Great Britain. But here we, we're up about 20 to 30 percent in wages overnight. So we have a new type of worker that may not have considered hospitality ever before that says, oh, for 18 bucks an hour, I'll try the front desk. They come in. HR is a little short staffed in many cases. There's not sufficient onboarding. There's not education on what the industry is. A first couple of double shifts and getting yelled at by guests, they're out the door. So I can't tell you how many owner operators, general managers telling me they're having 30 to 60% short term turnover and it's a revolving door. So now they're coming to me. What can we do to engage? What can we do to engage? Well, I'm one little guy in one little school. So what I did is I took our certificate that was not really meant for engagement. And I said, listen, this is three months. It's online. It's super cheap. Why don't you rally around them, give them lifelong education, have them report once every two weeks what they're doing, feel connected to you and use the certificate as an engagement tool. And that's what I've been doing in my tiny little corner of the world. But the engagement factor is what's missing now. So yes, they're coming in for the dollars, but they're not feeling connected to the industry. Whereas prior to COVID, hospitality workers were hospitality workers. They knew they wanted to work in hospitality. That's what they loved. That's what they did. Now we're attracting people from every kind of business imaginable, every age group. And I think we just don't have the time to really onboard and, and do things properly because we're so pressed for staff. That's just my guess. But if I tell you what's on my mind, on my radar that I hear all the time, it's short-term turnover is like nothing we've ever seen before. Does this make sense for you guys in the UK? Is this happening? Well, again, from a hospitality sort of perspective, um, for my specialism, which is obviously revenue management, um, but also obviously in the sales and marketing side of things, but less so on that side, to be honest. We're looking at 20 to 30% increase on salaries. Um, I was talking to a five-star luxury um, group yesterday at the table, and you know, I think the biggest one was, of course, housekeeping. Um, the fight for housekeepers was unreal. Um, another obviously operational staff, but we were looking at almost up to 50%. Um, so again, the, the, the one problem is we've got now is the conversations that we were having yesterday is if we are going in, well, we are going into this uh, recession, is do we start seeing a very familiar uh, track record as we saw in COVID with regards to talent? Um, because if we do, it, I, I hope, and I say this again to any hoteliers that are watching, we learned the lessons from COVID. Because if we didn't, God help us after after the recession, to be totally honest with you. Because if we go down the same route, although I do not believe under any circumstances it is going to hit us anywhere near like COVID did, but if the mentality is the same, recruitment stops, and then that culture of underpaying staff because you know jobs are going through the floor, redundancies start happening, it, it's not a good way to go. And I made that very clear to a lot of people yesterday. That culture did not help our industry whatsoever. But the salary increases, Hell yes, that has happened and that is across the board. 
Yeah, we need it. We need, we've needed those for 50 years. I mean, just nobody mm-hmm. wanted to go out on a leg and do it. Co- you know, the difference from 9-11, Persian Gulf War, recessions, is that COVID stopped everyone in their tracks to think and reflect and be with other people that they didn't really know what they did. Because guess what? We all work 50 hours in hospitality running in circles. So we didn't have time to really, oh, yeah, you're in IT. Oh, that's great. Da, da. Go back to the front desk. You know, so... Mm-hmm. This was a reset on a magnitude that we will probably, hopefully, never have again. Um, but the turnover is cautious to me. I have had a tiny minority of leaders ask me when I thought we could roll back wages, and I just <laughs> scoffed and laughed and said, "Are you, you know, are you <laughs> kidding me?" Um, luckily, that's a tiny fraction of one to five percent. But to even ask that question is is ludicrous. And, um, you know, here in the U.S., no matter what the current administration wants to call a recession, we're in a recession as well. And the thing is, we can't roll back average daily rate and menu prices and all if we're going to maintain this level of labor. And guess what? We're going to maintain this level level of labor pay because there's no going back. So the new model is a way to just flesh it out. And Thomas, to your point, I was on a call yesterday with a regional VP from a management company here that has, I don't know, 250 hotels. And she mm. told me in her in her area of 40 hotels, she still is not completely staffed in sales and marketing and revenue. Yep. And yep. she and she and she can't get there. And she has some turnover higher than what she was used we, to. We but, said this during you know, COVID, Peter. Uh, on this show many times, HR and sales, and, and actually some, some in, in the in, in engineering, but mainly HR and sales were gobbled up during COVID because it was so mm-hmm. transferable. Yep. People came yeah. in, swooped them up, and they're not coming back. Yeah, so they, sales You're right. gone, right? Yeah, they've gone to insurance, real estate, banking, pharmaceutical, yeah, yeah, pharmaceutical everywhere, e-commerce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are rounding out. Gosh, it's been an hour, and I. Don't even know how that happened. Um, we always do. And, and Christine's not here, so I don't even, definitely don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, but I'm not as I'm not as peppy and happy as Christine. It's kind of it's a sad it's a sad it's a sad show. It's a very solemn show. <laughs> but I want to go around the clock. I, I'm going to leave myself out because I'm going to ask the question for all three of you. I'll start with Thomas, Aiden, then Peter, and I have two questions I want to pop up and just go around the clock. Um, so boom, let's think big. I want to give some solutions. There's there's plenty of people watching. I just looked and there's several on all three platforms. So let's think big. Let's give solutions. Give us, Thomas, then Aiden, then Peter, give me uh, an outside the box idea to attract and retain talent. Um, I've actually got a good one that somebody brought up yesterday. So I, I really like this one. Um, it's actually it's actually not something that I've really thought about before either. So I'm going to make it as quick as possible. Um, but basically getting your current staff to do uh, behavioral and value-based assessments. So not numerical and all this, uh, you know, uh, literal, uh, sorry, literacy uh, assessments, but behavioral and value-based uh, assessments to figure out where your current teams are at the moment, what um, sort of areas of development there are, but also in terms of the talent coming in, what are you missing to really enhance that current team? So from an employer's perspective, having that data in-house and then every time you go out to, to recruit, you then put over that um, behavioral and value-based assessment for them to answer a number of questions and to see what the results come from. So you're basically matching the data that, okay, we're missing somebody who's a real go-getter. We've got loads of people that are really sort of team-focused, but also customer-based focused. But what we need is a real pusher, somebody who's going to go out there and drive sales, and then other team members see that and then get engaged by that. That might be an area of development that we need within our current team. Or it could be that we've got loads of fantastic salespeople at the moment, but what we're missing is somebody to really give that guidance, give that support and development within that team. So maybe we need to go out and find and attract that talent. So it's giving the employer more of a direction rather than thinking, where do I start? Or you could even give that to your HR and internal uh, talent acquisitions teams to say, not only is this the job spec, but this is the type of personality we need. This is the type of character we need. So again, it comes back to that point of, are we really educating our HR teams? This is a fantastic tool to be able to do that. So I, I'd never thought of it before, 
but it's something that actually got a lot of attention around the table. So it's a bit of a different one. Um, rather than looking at purely skill-based, it's more looking at suitability rather than um, ability, I suppose. So yeah, that's that's my one, which is a bit off the wall for me, to be honest, because I'm a real people person. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so for me, I... I don't think this is outside the box, but it uh, could potentially be considered outside the box because nobody does it, um, but they should be doing it. I think the easy one to implement immediately is to stop writing job descriptions and start writing job adverts. That's how you attract the best talent. So for yeah. years, we have written what we expect people to be doing in a job, what we want from them. and. Um, what they need in order to be successful in their application process with us. So let's flip that on, on, on its head and say, this is why you should join us. This is what you do. This is what you'll get from us. This is how it will benefit you and your career in joining us and make it an advert, make it interesting and forget what they're doing. Not outside the box, but I don't see enough companies. <laughs> yeah, no. Right no. Underneath an advert. Um, to retain talent, the biggest thing I am seeing at the moment is uh, people want to have purpose and value in their work. So forget the, like money is great and it will always be a priority, but somebody will take a job with a clear purpose and vision and strategy and an employer that looks after their staff more than they will an extra £1,000 a year, £2,000 a year on salary. So um, in order to retain, start thinking, uh, what do we do for our current staff? Do we, uh, focus on sustainability? Do we have a mental health and awareness program? Uh, do we look after our employees? Do we give charity days? Do we try to make inclusive an inclusive culture where people want to work? Stop thinking short-term retention is all about how much money I can give them to hold onto them. More, mm -hmm. what can I do to show that I support them as an employer? Love that. Well, uh, Aiden's very hard to follow because that's awesome. I mean, for me, you know, I, I said it already. I think engagement in my little way of a benefits box where you pick what's going to make you a happier human being and i value you and i take care of you um it follows along exactly what aiden's saying whether i want to be on the sustainability committee or i want to be on the animal welfare committee or something that is going to be out of the box that takes time that we just haven't done before because we get too busy in our in our little worlds. Um, money is important. I think we cannot go back to being perceived as the low wage high uh, the low wage high hour industry. That has to go. And then there's one thing I really like. It comes from the 1970s. If you Google it, it it was kind of sexist at the time. So don't take it in that context, but National Airlines had a campaign where they would hire flight attendants and their campaign was fly me. I'm Marlene, come fly me. And it would talk about Marlene. I think we need that sexy campaign of our hourlies. I'm, you know, I'm George and have a campaign about George and advertise it that way. George is a line cook. Show some of his pictures, show some of this. I put some links, um, in the private chat, you know, Jeremy, if you could share them with anybody watching or after. Um, one is just my LinkedIn, connect with me. So I love ideas. I want I, I love ideas, chatting, chatting. And then another one is these little short videos that we've been doing to kind of engage and get outside the box. So we fly drones now, and we used to fly them outside just to look at the building so pretty. Now we, we try to fly them through departments if we can and actually show people in their work. It's really out of the box. I've lost a few drones. I got to steer clear of that. But, but I mean, like, out of the box is getting in to really know what we do in hospitality. Because those of us in the business, we love it. And the message just ne it never fully gets out there. So I, when the first thing you said about this, it's like, I always remember the Fly Me campaign. It's been 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. But I would love to hear an accountant say, hey, come see me. I'm Celine. This is what I do. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe Celine will connect with some of your applicants that don't know what an accountant does. I know it from me, you know, Aiden recruits in accounting and, and Thomas and finance. 
I always think spreadsheets, ah, but maybe they have fun. Maybe they're interacting with clients. So I don't know. Outside of the box, sexy, sexy. Yeah, Peter, but that's that's, that. that's 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 a brilliant idea. And and the fact that it's not happening enough is crazy because back in the day, when you're talking about that ad coming out, you had to pay big bucks to get that in a magazine or a TV. Now you Correct. just get a TikTok TikTok account or an Instagram or and then bada bang, you're done and you can post it up and get a following. So it's, it's possible it's there. Uh, yeah, yep. imagine having just a few of your associates that are willing to do an ad and spotlight that as a job. Get away from the job descriptions. Talk about, you know, yeah, what I do, but more, I, I hate old style job descriptions. I hate them. I, yeah. I just do, you know? I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, this, I love this that. Is a question around the, around the clock. This is a pretty simple yes or no answer, and you can maybe elaborate a tiny bit yeah, we um, definitely don't just stick with yes or no i think everyone knows that <laughs> now. this is I'm an easy one though all right all right try your best. Best. all right we'll start with <laughs> we'll start with thomas is it a candidate or employer market how long do you think it lasts and does it even matter yes <laughs> yes which one <laughs> do you think it will last is the yes is it a can <laughs> i was i was sort of like yes yes you guys good answer aiden your your answer yeah cool um i, <laughs> I... no it's probably yes or no i'm not having that <laughs> i don't think it matters and i think it is uh, more of a candidate's market still <laughs> salaries are 10 15 20 cent higher and i'm all for it i'm pro candidate and yeah. uh, long may it last yeah yes <laughs> as an educator i would say if you put that on my exam and told students to put yes or no they're going to beat you up so that's not a yes or no question my friend. But there's three uh, questions in there so one of them was a yes question, yes no question right? oh okay so i sandwiched it in there all right for, we're, we're you know, pulling your leg we're pulling your leg yes oh, for me for me you know i don't think it matters i think it's still leading toward the candidate but I really think it's because we, as employers, as a hospitality industry, um, don't really have the leg up to know what we're doing yet and what we're going to pay long term and what we really need and what we're going to do if a recession hits. So that puts it in the side of the candidate for now. And we're still not fully staffed in most most venues where, you know, some are, but we're not there. So yeah, it still leans toward the candidate, but I don't think that matters. I don't think it's in us versus them. We're in this together. And um, you know, we need to do our side to make you like our industry and value you. And uh, I can tell you as a kid of the eighties, nobody valued what I wanted to do or my hobbies or anything in that time. But now if I don't care about you as a human, I'm not gonna keep you, period. Yeah, I don't think it matters anymore either like i'm not even phased like when i hear candidate or employer market i'm like it doesn't really matter we were completely obliterated during covid like we stopped it's this, talking about it haven't we like the new normal is there's no new normal like i have no <laughs> yeah. idea like look at the news yeah. every day the world's turning on its head like i can't even we can't even go a week without something groundbreaking happen so like I, correct I, it's just like i just kind of just cancel the noise and keep moving forward yeah. um, but uh, no you know. Nobody knows what Q1 next year is going to bring. From a hospitality perspective in the UK market, we're all up in the air. So <laughs> I, I, as you say, I think we ride the wave as we have. And we think, well, we, we act accordingly. It's as simple as that. Um, and do our, and do that our yeah, do our best. I, I moderated a panel, a panel of general managers uh, about a month ago, and they all of them unanimously agreed that this is the hardest budgeting prediction they've ever had in their 20 to 30 year careers. However, every owner wants them to still budget solid as if we're going to stay the same <laughs> or go up. So that's not going to change, period. You know, it's but funny. They, I, I asked the question yesterday to the table, to every commercial director and director of revenue around this table. I said, um, how are we forecasting for, for, the, for the start of next year? Every single one of them laughed because they just said, you mean how are the owners and operators forecasting for next year? Because it was Correct. like, we don't know. <laughs> so yeah, go Correct. For it. You'll have your expectations. Just... It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Correct. 
Oh my God. Hey, well, it's been 10 minutes past the hour. So I'm thank thank you for those who are watching. Um, there's so much more that I want to touch on, but I'm trying to bite my tongue because we'll just, I guess, put it on the next next episode. I want to say thank you, Peter, for, for joining us and uh pleasure the sharing sharing your insight. I really I've been trying to get you on for a while, so I'm glad that it finally happened. And uh, uh thank you. Hey, you guys are awesome and fun and tell Christine hello when she's back. And uh, you know, yes, I, I try to be my opinion self, but it's like based on thousands of people telling me stuff. So a lot there's a lot of themes there that are they're there and they are real and that's how it is. And so it may come across like this is coming out of me, but this is coming thousands of people that we hear from. And I love it that mm -hmm. way because the collective voice is the voice and there are definitely patterns and all of you are in the, in it daily. And, you know, you know, and um, that's why I, I love talking with you. I've been on other shows, other pod, on Glenn's show, like two or three times with you. And it's, it's so it's funny. We're like, not, you're not a recruiter, but we share like, the same passion and opinions and like a lot of times when you post things on linkedin i am like oh my god that's like exactly what i'm thinking <laughs> thank, you, thank you for saying that and pushing that um you know sometimes it might it, it comes across as people might think i'm being negative but i'm really just trying to share like transparently to try to improve things like the Correct. comment earlier right i said recruiters are lazy i i'm not saying all recruiters i'm a i'm a flipping recruiter but like right. let's be honest about it People, people, okay, let's not say recruiters, people in general in any profession. There's probably lazy doctors and lazy lawyers too, okay? But that's that's a lot of the issue is there's a lot of that going on, and we have to talk about it. And we have yep. to educate, which is what we're trying to do. So for and me we're, to bring And we're that busy. Up, I don't even call it lazy. I call it busy. It's like you have to filter what you can do yeah, in your yeah. information technology overwhelming day. And so we become very zone like of what we can do and what we can't do but i my mm -hmm. goal is just to you know pass on the words to the industry because i love this business i'm never going to leave it i'll be in it till the day i retire or die plain and simple and i want unless you go into veterinarian unless you become a veterinarian uh, well right? but that's still hospitality <laughs> it's just hospitality with a guest that can't yell back but it's hospitality <laughs> they can yeah. bite back yeah, they could bite me. That's true. yeah. Put the gloves on with the cats, you know. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Hey, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Jeremy Nichols with Gecko Hospitality. You can find me on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, the whole nine yards. That's it. That's it for me. Um, Thomas, you're gonna take the take the mic. Yeah, I'm Thomas Finn, the Emerging Director of Edwards and Finn. You can find me on LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, um, and Facebook. So yeah, check me out. You'll be able to find Edwards and Finn in all those platforms. Amazing. And I'll close out the show this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We really look forward to seeing you again next month. Uh, my name is Aidan Murray. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And Thank we you. will put your LinkedIn in the comment on the show section so people can connect with you and follow and uh, maybe we'll see you again. I'd love it. Thank you so much, all. Have a good no weekend. Problem. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye.